So we'll do this a little impromptu, a little ad hoc. Uh, first of all, Jim, thank you very much. I think this is a, a fascinating uh, conference and, and the panel today. Uh, I'm really excited about, um, mostly because, as, as Jim mentioned, I'm EVP of the Nielsen Marketing Cloud from a, from a commercial perspective, running sales, marketing, business development, those things. And what we are tasked with in, in working with brands uh, and agencies and, and large platform companies is, is to help provide better measurement, better attribution. Um, so this is something that is near and dear to Nielsen's heart and to my team's heart, but knowing the weeds and knowing the, the point of view from the brand side is really what matters, and it's really what's interesting to, to me and my team. So I'm really happy to have Teresa, Brittany, Michael, and Eamon here. Um, so we'll kick it off with questions um, that, that not only I know I have in the, in the space, but this is, came up uh, from some collaborative topics that we discussed. So, one of the first things is when we talk about attribution, it's sort of a catch-all phrase. And, and what I'd love to understand from the panel here, who, who are certainly experts in the field, is, is how do you define attribution for your particular business? And, and you can, can you define sort of the fundamental goals and the real-world applications for attribution? Because as we see it, attribution can mean a lot of things. It's very gray. Um, you know, it could be in-flight analytics. It could be sales effects, sales lift studies. Like, how do you each for your businesses see attribution? What is attribution to you? And we can uh, maybe start at the end, Teresa. Yeah, well, I th there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat, but at the end of the day, we're a very, very large media spender. And so at the end of the day, we're trying to figure out what's driving sales and what's not, and how do we continually tweak the mix in order to drive more efficiencies and more effective media. OK. And do you, um, in general, are there particular, just, just so I'm clear, are there particular products that you look at and say, it's multi-touch attribution, or there's sales effect type stuff. Like, what is primary users? What is Verizon users? It depends primary? on the questions. So, obviously, we acquired Convertro as part of the AWOL acquisition, so we use them for the digital optimizations. We also do, like most advertisers, econometric modeling. And then at times, if we're asking more branding-related questions, we might do some of the ad effectiveness studies and things like that. So, it, it really depends on what it is we're trying to understand exactly. I think one of the misnomers with attribution is that it's just one question, right? Yeah. There's a lot of nuance in trying to understand what what is effective and how do you define effectiveness. And so there's a lot of different techniques that could get deployed depending upon the specific question. Okay, thanks. It's a good I answer. Go. Uh, <laughs> I agree with her. I'd add that we are starting to think more of media as an investment the same way a lot of our agencies are. And when you think of any investment, it's what's the return on that investment. And so when we drive our media like Verizon does, we look at econometric modeling, make sure our investment drives sales and other behaviors. We're also looking, of course, at our digital and our individual media spend to understand how did each of them drive the types of behaviors we want to make profit. And I'd point out that it applies not only for our new sales, but also uplift approaches. So how can we use marketing to drive profit-making behaviors for our current customers as well? And so the attribution for us is how do we link that spend that we're doing in various types of media and marketing all the way through to the bottom line, to any type of profit making that we can derive. And it includes many of the techniques Teresa mentioned, as well as some in-house work that we're trying to do around how do we model this out the way the bank models other investments. Okay. Brittany. Um, at Weight Watchers, I would say our, our mission is really about inspiring and guiding users to make healthy choices that can transform their lives. So <laughs> attribution for me is understanding what marketing channels are helping us reach that user and inspire her to, to pursue that healthy change that, that will ultimately improve her life. So really focusing on, on multi-touch attribution and understanding what is the stacking effect of all those channels as we're reaching that, that user or that consumer. Um, we have a, a pretty long consumer cycle uh, or consideration cycle, so there's multiple touch points that go in before she ultimately decides that she's going to take that next step on her weight loss journey. So for us, understanding how all, all those multiple touch points are coming together to ultimately influence that, that conversion or that next step. And that next step just being that someone has signed up for your sign program. Up. Okay, yeah. cool. Amen? As, as being in an agency, you have to you have multiple clients. So you have someone who's on the brand side as well as people who are on the acquisition side. So there's a constant focus of being fit to allocate your budget all the way down the funnel, from the starter through the influencer to the closer. So being fit to balance those budgets out, being fit to attribute so that you're actually getting sales as well as building brand. So multi-touch attribution is critically important, and being fit to then allocate correctly and convince the person at the bottom of the funnel that without the brand at the top of the funnel, it's not going to work. Last touch attribution or first attribution does not get you there, so you need to have that multi attribution working for you, but everybody on the client side buying into the idea, it is doing multiple things in the funnel, and they can see where the role plays in, by using attribution. So 
so, and, and, and I imagine, yes, you sit in the middle of a variety of different asks from clients, um, and you know, so do we in, in some way, shape, or form. So when you, when you talk about, because everyone's mentioned, obviously, attribution, but multi-touch attribution, a couple of you mentioned, and, and again, that in itself uh, has different sort of views and, and, and ideas of how that's successful and what goes into multi-touch attribution. Um, but what are, what are things, and, and you can pick MTA or you can pick another area, what, what are the couple things that you would do um, to sort of standardize any of those attribution solutions? Like if it were, you know, the offline sales data needs to be vetted or it needs to be um, tagging of campaigns needs to be having some sort of a, a process associated with it. Like what actually, what are standards we can apply to, and you can pick any of the solutions, MTA is one of them, um, to make that better, to make that um, a common um, dialogue or a common currency across all those brands you're talking about? Well, I think the first one would be fit to get all the channels in there. And right now, because we have walled gardens in certain places, so getting social in there is quite tricky. Uh, depending on who you're using for uh, television, again, getting that data, putting that in, depending on what attribution vendor you're using for that, they have different methodologies for getting television into the, the customer journey, into the path. So those are the key things that need to be standardized. How do you pull television in? How do you pull social in? Tagging and tracking across all campaigns is going to be important, but there are a couple of big channels that are still in a non-standardized format and different vendors have different approaches to pull those in, and you get very different answers based on who you talk to. So those are, those are barriers to any of these working, and, and I think that's, again, common feedback. Uh, Brittany? Yeah, I would, I would agree completely. I think breaking down those those silos of data and integrating them into one collective organism is, is really a challenge as we look at our stack of, of ad tech and our stack of uh, measurement within, within our walls. We are looking at site-side data, we're looking at media metrics, we're looking at consumer um, conversion funnels, financial numbers, how do you bring all of that together into something that reads out as one collective um, output that we all can buy into. That's, that's, I think, one of our biggest challenges internally around standardization. Also, I would say, building off of what Eamon said, how do we start to integrate a multi-channel multi model so that you're looking at offline channels and a mix of, of bottoms up digital metrics as well, because often you're, you're looking at you know, top-down modeling and getting a different readout of what you're seeing in the more granular bottoms up. So finding that middle ground and how you can buy into both sides of that data to make it the most actionable is definitely a standardization challenge as well. So I'm never sitting in the middle because everybody else has all the good answers. But <laughs> I will say one thing we've, uh, it's really important also to think about that tail end. So what are you actually modeling toward? And we found that attribution vendors have a lot of different definitions of how they model toward success. And what we sometimes find is the financial metric we think we're optimizing toward isn't necessarily what that vendor was built to do or designed for. I think that another missing part is agreement on when we describe multi-touch attribution and the modeling that goes into it or the analytics behind it, agreement on what those things actually are about and what they take, where their assumptions are. Often it's throw everything into this pot, stir it up, and what comes yeah. out is this prediction of all these magical things. If we were able to be more crisp and clear on the vendor side and on the client side and the agency side, to be fair, uh, for all these different pieces, we might be able to better compare the solutions and understand are we buying the right solution for our marketing needs and our business? And I find it still very confusing and you know, the benefits of the vendors for keeping it a little chaotic and nebulous, but it would help all of us if we could standardize some of those pieces. I really don't like having to follow you when you say things. <laughs> uh, I think one of the issues we have, I mean, I, all, of the, all of those are great points. I think the speed is an issue. So when we think about television, which is still the largest channel, there's a very long lag time in the, in act, looking at Nielsen over there, um, in the actualization of the television buys. You bias. beat up on me all confidence, sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll just point it. There are other people yeah. up there that deal with this. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you're 180 days out. So, I, I think just the speed that we need to operate is a challenge, and the various data sources have different latencies and how quickly you're able to get them. So, I think that's the first big issue. And then the second thing is, at the end of the day, all of the attribution models favor reach-based mediums, or they're essentially built for television, and reach may not always be the objective of a particular medium or channel, or kicking up more impressions or more reach is not necessarily costing you more money. So how do you adjust for that, particularly with digital, um, when you're looking at your overall mix? I think those are the two of the big ones that we've been wrestling with as an organization. So, so uh, very good answers and, and stuff I've heard at the top level, and, and you certainly drilled into some details. So one is, is some of these barriers to success here is one, putting all this, first of all, having the best data, the correct data that, that actually measures what you're looking to measure. 
having that you know sort of at scale all in the one place. Um, one thing a little off script is what we, we didn't talk about as much as, and again, I have a little bit of a bias, but not towards even Nielsen, just in general, the, the marketing cloud and marketing technology. With all of those things, let's assume they were all good. What, what technology do you use to bring all these together? Because you're talking about ingestion of data from a variety of different uh, touch points, <coughs> offline, online, et cetera. Do you, and, and I know maybe you guys aren't experts in, in, in the weeds on all MarTech, but what, what technology are either you using today or um, that you think will help do some of these things? Because it's not just having the data, it's connecting that data. Sorcery. Sorcery? <laughs> <laughs> or is it black magic? <laughs> Uh, why don't we start here just to keep going down this way, but um, we can reverse it next time, Teresa, I promise. I think with the, with, with the coming out with Assembly Media, we actually have a tech stack. So we actually ingest all of the DCM, DBM data. So whether we actually build our own attribution models or whether we uh, use, work with the client and use the vendor that they recommend, we already have the ability to actually provide to uh, the attribution vendor log level data, which they want. So if they're not pixeling their da the data or they're pixeling the sites, we can provide that to them. And again, that's one I think where clients don't really understand the volume of data. So we're talking, you know, like, you can get to terabytes of data very, very quickly. The ability of some attribution vendors to actually ingest that is also a bit of an issue, especially for larger clients with very large digital spends. So understanding the tech piece is critically important because otherwise you're doing a one and done where you pull in a certain amount of data. If you want to constantly do attribution over time, you're constantly pulling in the digital data in real time, that's a huge technological issue. Uh, and having the ability to work with cloud services to pull that through and then to push that back out to the attribution vendor or those that can actually do it in-house, they actually already have a system to do that, but the technology is critically important. So as an agency, you see, and, and it's a, I'm glad I started with you, because you you're sitting in the middle and kind of are serving a lot of different masters in terms of brands and, and their needs, but you mentioned you know, Google in that example, and DBM, and, and yeah. are, you have to actually, do you have to be somewhat agnostic to technology? Uh, or do you have your own proprietary technology that you then augment with? No, we're, we're using open source technology. You okay. have to because you're going to be pulling in from multiple different sources. Uh, but you've got to have a, a technology that can scale very, very quickly. Uh, so that's really important. That has to be modular uh, uh, because a client could add on a new channel. So you've got the ability to pull that in, integrate that. So essentially, it's forcing... Uh, either the agency or the client to actually build out sure. large databases and pulling in the big data, or traditionally they were working with CRM data. Yeah. So it's totally changed what both the client needs to think about and what the agency or the attribution partners have got to think about in the way of cloud storage. Sure, and Teresa, maybe we'll, we'll start <coughs> this way back, back down here. Um, I, in, in I imagine, on, and Eamon mentioned, that the agency has a, a variety of different um, tasks and asks from clients. How do you see it? I mean, your technology, you have made some purchases and also I know have your own technology. How do you sort of ingest this, these raw ingredients to bake the cakes that you need to bake? Yeah, I mean, I actually think the tech's the easy part, and it's the part, but that's the part we as an industry focus on the most. You know, how we, we focus on, you know, how do you process the data and big data or a lot of data, which is really what most advertisers have, including ourselves. A little bit biased coming from, from Verizon, who can manage data well, but I, I think we focus a lot on the tech and on the stack where and we forget that analytics is an art and a science. So it's not about some machine processing all this data and spitting out the perfect answer. It's about, yes, you have to process data and there's a lot of ways to do that. But then how do you get the right people on top of those machines to interpret it and to make decisions off of it and to um, leverage that as one of the inputs, one of the many inputs that they should be looking at is to allocate and optimize spend. So the tech is not just, um, uh, I mean, not, not, it's not a flat commodity, but you see the analytics piece on top of that as, as more important than the actual technology. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Sure, and a great example of that is regulated industries that Verizon to inner city puts a different constraint on media optimization than just your average media buyer. So it's something that the model spits out as an obvious next step. We would say, that's great too. We'd love to do that also. It's too bad to legal. But there's a lot of cases where there's a, a alternate, different type of constraints that come in from the business model and how you go to market. City markets differently than other companies because we're a different type of company. And not all the technologies are <laughs> flexible enough to deal with that. And so it wind up being that mix of somebody who understands what you're trying to achieve and the business objectives and how that translates into profit, understanding how to leverage the technology, not just the stack itself. By the way, none of them are integrated, so we, we, don't, we don't have a happy answer for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Brittany, how about you? 
Um, I think, I mean, there's a lot of fragmentation of data. So for us, it's more about how do we isolate that single user ID as we're tracking that consumer journey and understanding how that consumer is activating across multiple different devices. So for us, the ad server becomes really important in, in tracking to that single user ID um, and where we can start to advance from there to track against cross device as well. So you're building a device graph at the same time as we're moving towards a more people-based form of measurement. So I think, you know, pairing together the ad server so you're reaching and tracking all of those touch points, but then also pairing it back to a, tack, uh, a tech stack that can knit together all of those different devices as well is crucial for us in understanding a single user and, and her journey towards the brand. Okay, and, and one thing when we, we had our, uh, which was a very educational, sorry, did you have a, another? I'd say luckily there's so many device graphs and individual person identifiers to choose from these days, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in our, in our prep, we talked about um, one thing that was really interesting that was a, a data point um, that stuck out to me is we all talked about, or, or you talked about, and, and Eamon, it's probably a little different from, from his point of view as well cause at being at the agency, is organizationally, um, in terms of actually at your organization, who actually signs off or who's in the biggest influencer in terms of, of attribution or to move ahead with larger attribution opportunities, um, and, and I think some of you mentioned that the, you know it was procurement was involved or finance and others. Like, what is in terms of your your organizations uh, and maybe even who you work with at, at different brands? Who actually is the the owner and influencer of of attribution and making that successful and budget behind it and things like that? Um, go ahead. For, well, well, with clients, it's usually the CMO or the main uh, marketing client. Um, because they're responsible for that budget, and often it's a very large budget, so how, how it's allocated. Uh, so that's very, very important. So their ability to actually get additional budget, uh, the, how they'll spread their budget out among the different channels that they manage. Uh, so that's where uh, we have the most interaction. At the CMO at, suite. At the CMO suite, uh, because they have the budget to determine, because a lot of these attribution vendors are not inexpensive. So um, it is. It is a big decision to make. That, to, to make about. So, uh, in optimizing a, a budget, am I actually saving more money than I'm spending on the attribution vendor? Uh, is 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 probably the first piece of math that's done. Um, so that's that's where you start. Uh, it's all about budgets and what the, the ROI on that the ROI. that opportunity to get the ROI on all the other stuff you're doing. Exactly. Okay, okay. Uh, Brittany. It's, it's largely a marketing-led um, initiative as we're you know, analyzing our own channels and determining where we can invest our dollars most efficiently. We partner very heavily with finance as well, also for that ROI analysis um, and, and taking their advisement and, and where we can find the most value out of the solution and also the shifts that we're making in media in accordance to the readout. Okay. Michael? And I think that's really important to point out that this, obviously the CMO and the marketing suite is the one that owns the budget and makes the decision, but they're often tasked with talking to finance to explain that the yeah. XT million or XT hundred million or XT billion, depending on who you are, uh, is actually returning value. And you turn to your attribution, your media mix folks to support that argument. You can try to link it to sales with all this last click stuff, but we are trying to get away from that, right? So it's tough sometimes to get a finance group who's used to a very different way of thinking about money to understand what multi-touch attribution can do or what me, me, marketing mix or media mix optimization can do. And we found that the vendors aren't quite there at the proof points yet. That is, they haven't set up structured tests that can convince somebody who isn't in our business how to think about these things. And that's been a big struggle, I think, for a lot of the, at least the companies I've talked to, large companies, especially banks, that have struggled to convince folks outside of marketing that this stuff is the real way to go. It seems like, why would you ever question it? But it still is a tough argument outside of the marketing suite. Um, I think one of the interesting things over the last 10 or so years, maybe a little bit longer, I don't like to admit how old I am, but um, is it has switched from a, sort of a purely finance exercise to something that's actually used by the marketing organizations. So when I look, think back you know, quite a few years ago, it was finance, okay, check, marketing works, these people can get their bonuses or their salaries, and the debt kind of sits on the shelf, and it's an annual exercise, and you kind of put it away and forget about it. So I think one of the positive shifts that we've seen is it moving from a, the finance org into the CMO organizations and actually becoming the analytics becoming kind of a living, breathing thing that you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis as opposed to sort of a deck that sits on a shelf. Um, so I think that's actually been a very positive movement. Okay, cool. Um, one other area that we want to talk about is, and again, I, uh, 
don't throw any darts or I'm not suggesting Nielsen is, should be and should not be. This is what we want our panel to talk about. But is there anyone, we mentioned there's a variety of different flavors to attribution. There's different vendors. There's different data that's going into attribution solutions. Is there anyone, and if the answer is no, great, um, but is there anyone who that we see can emerge as sort of an independent arbiter uh, of insights that can be a neutral party that can look at you know, this, this market and try to you know, formalize a little more or that we would trust as someone who um, can essentially be the currency for this, um, whether it's the agency, whether it's uh, tech vendors, whoever. Um, Anyone can take it. I, it's, um, okay. it's a partnership. I think you know when you look at the different vendors in the marketplace, depending on your exact business questions and needs, some are better than others, depending on what it is that you're trying to do, right? They have different, different secret sauces and different approaches. But this idea of the fox and the hen house, it's a partnership. It's a partnership between the marketer and the agency and the tech vendor. And to, you have to trust your partners and you have to work together in order to interpret it. When I see, when I've seen implementations where it was purely the tech vendor, directly with the client, and then the agency gets the output and they don't know what to do with it or it's not aligned to how they're planning and buying um, and vice versa. So I, I think it really is a partnership of the three and I don't think we'll ever be at a place where there's you know just one perfect vendor for everyone or one perfect methodology for everyone given the diversity and how people look at marketing and how different companies operate. Okay. Yeah, but trust but verify. So yes, it does need to be that partnership, but we keep running into situations where each of the players, perhaps us included, hasn't always behaved in the best possible way to optimize outcomes for the partnership. And so trying to make sure that we think about what's the right way to make sure our agency is spending efficiently for us, but that somebody is verifying that. What's the best way to make sure that the vendor that's doing multi-touch attribution is as transparent as possible and highlighting places where they're seeing concern with their models and highlighting we're a little unconfident about this area here because the data just isn't supporting some of these claims we've tried to make. Even with the agency, having the agency say, we are so sure about this part. We've had trouble with this and having everybody be up front. The partnership can get there, but we've seen that there needs to be a little bit of keeping an eye on each of the different sides. And I wonder if perhaps as the industry grows up and matures a little bit, these fights about transparency that we see on the front page of the Wall Street Journal don't need to be such a news headline event as we discover the best way to say, what are some standards we can set that eliminate this friction point where we don't have to keep an eye on all this stuff and instead can trust that, yeah, you know, we're doing some good stuff and get to that partnership where I think we'd all like to be. It's really tough when you come in and the front page of the Wall Street Journal is agencies, sometimes agencies that some of us might use, have uh, been busted for transparency problems and you have to walk around hiding that headline from all the people you work with, right? So uh, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it can be a tough thing, but I think there's some value to balance out the partnership and growing toward that partnership, but also having some independent uh, standard setting and arbitration is to make sure those folks keep an eye on all these things. Is there anyone you see that potentially may be that entity or just that it needs to, you see the value of having it? It's tough. I mean, it's easy to throw out ARF and 4As and ANA and other groups like that that are oversight groups. And, uh, you know, to some extent those groups have helped. To some extent those groups have their own biases and problems. So I think we'll have to work together as all the partnerships, uh, all the advertisers, along with agencies, agency holding companies, along with the vendors to say, what's the right way to approach this problem to make sure we're all getting the right things out of it for all of us? And uh, so I don't have a great answer for that. I think it's going to wind up being an industry group, but we'll have to see. Okay. Brittany? It is a, a system of checks and balances. I would agree. I think everyone's trying to prove their value. You have the, the attribution solution trying to show their value. Their agency is trying to show that they're making the right decisions with your investment. As an advertiser, we're trying to show we're <laughs> driving value for the business. So, you know, we're all working together in this partnership to evaluate everything together. And I think that is where, you know, you, it's, it's a safe room to start poking holes if there's a safe partnership there because you need to lean on the attribution solution to start advising how you can make those shifts. For us, it was, you know, definitely a, a cultural shift internally. So, you know, their advisement is definitely helpful. And then you have the media agency who is the closest to the day-to-day -day decisionings with the media. So their in insight and input is definitely valuable as well. And I think as the brand, we're kind of that middle ground in, in arbitering the, the two and, and making sure we feel comfortable with the results that we're bringing in internally and that they're actually actionable. So I think everything kind of works together and that partnership is important, but also the checks and balances is equally important as well. 
I think there's a bit of an evolution taking place where the data is uh, democratizing a lot of the decision making. So in the past, data was massaged in different ways. Only certain data was shared. In an attribution system, everything needs to go in. And even in, in a lot of cases, the cost need to go in in certain places. So the transparency is going to be forced upon people through uh, attribution modeling. Uh, but the agency's gotten more important in the role because no longer they're viewed as kind of the fox in the hen house because with the different channels, and again, uh, as our previous speaker had mentioned, uh, the idea of messaging and the idea of the, the, the context and uh, how the customer experience works, the agency's got a better handle on that. So how the pieces of data need to be actually put properly into the system means that part has got to work. That also forces the attribution vendors to, to not just stick with their product, but to evolve the, evolve the product as the marketing itself evolves. So it is not just a partnership, but there's an evolution taking place. Uh, and I think that, that's very, very important. So, so the, the, uh, this is very uh, interesting, the different answers, because they're all kind of around the same thing. But you're saying the, the data coming in in a sort of transparent, free-flowing way that takes care of a lot of the problems, uh, or some of the problems that have been historically. It's for it, it, because it's it's forcing the agencies and the clients to actually a, agree on what should be in there, yep. uh, and at and some see level exactly what's in yeah, there. Okay. and it allows the 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 attribution vendor to actually put things in the right place mm -hmm. uh, and make those make those allocations correctly. But the context is important how the evolution taking place. I think that's where going back to the previous question, the standardization of what is attribution, standardization of the data itself, will also help that. Uh, we, we hit on it before, um, and we mentioned walled gardens briefly, but in the biggest challenging uh, challenges facing uh, uh, sort of our space and, and attribution and measurement in the space, um, we see it certainly um, at Nielsen, um, and, and a lot of our clients see it, where they say, we, you know, hey, we want to do XYZ measurement, multi-touch attribution, sales effect, things like that. Um, but you know, 40% or 70% or 20% of our budgets on Facebook, Amazon, Google, what have you. Um, how do you guys, uh, uh, people, men and women, how do you deal with um, those challenges? Because they're real and we kind of, frankly, I think do a great job at Nielsen with our solutions, kind of cobbling it together um, and, and have some strategic relationships with some of those client, uh, some of those uh, platforms I just mentioned. But it's tough. I mean, we see it from the client side. We talk to clients, and and I, I'd love your perspective on on how you are currently working, or maybe ways to that you envision this actually improving. Um, and and Brittany, why don't you start this time? Um, sure. I think we've been lucky to be situated in a really great place up until last week because we were an Atlas <laughs> client, <laughs> <laughs> so we weren't str struggling with the same um, you know, walled gardens with Facebook, which is a, a great channel for us to reach our core consumer, so we were able to bring in a lot of that, so I think ask me in a year how we're okay. addressing some of those so, walled gardens. So far it's been good. So far it's been pretty okay. good for us, but now we're uh, you know, faced with that challenge anew of how are we going to integrate these sources with, um, with Atlas going away, RIP. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so maybe we'll we'll catch you in a little while on yeah. that. Uh, Michael, we, we were in a, we were an Atlas uh, Atlas user as well, uh, late lamented in some ways, but in other ways, glad it's gone. I think walled gardens are a really tough problem. Uh, I worry that we are creating a world back like the ad networks of your, uh, where we have a totally separate view from each of these different populations and can't compare them. We talk about person-centric measurement, and then we kind of <clears throat> allow one group to say, we define what person-centric is in our world, and you're little on your own for everything else. So it makes it hard to compare some of these pieces. That being said, I mean, Facebook has done some amazing things to help bring advertising into their experience in a way that is pretty good for the user and pretty good for businesses, and that's it's a very admirable thing. I think we just need to balance out what are we doing with the measurement that they provide us? How do we use it appropriately? And how do we bring them into a model? And our model is able to understand the oddly biased view that Facebook has, which is an amazing amount of time spent on there, but there's actually a lot of stuff that happens outside as well. How to bring all that stuff together. Uh, I have to say, we, like you, we're very happy with a lot of the things that was provided us. And it's going to be interesting to see how, uh, how we all shift over without having access to some of those pieces. I mean, it's not. We can, we can pick on the wall gardens all we want, but at the end of the day, data scarcity is not a new problem that we've had. And so it, it's not like we've ever had a perfect data set where we could see absolutely everything. 
I mean, out of home has been around for like ever, and you still can't measure it in a model to save your life, you know. So, um, so while you know we're the first ones to push on the wall gardens for better access to data, it's it's just it's not a new problem that we've had as an industry. So um, I think it's to a certain extent it's always going to be there, and you have to sort of figure out not necessarily with the wall gardens, but there's going to be scarcity and there's going to be gaps and there's going to be holes in what you're looking at. And I think that's part of the art of how do you then, how do you deal with it? So you look at, well, you know, it's a, there's other, there's a, there's a few of them out there. You look at Facebook or others and you say, we measure over here and we also measure over here and we try to align these things together? I mean, we're going to obviously push as much as we can, right, as, as all advertisers are. I'm sure City's doing the same thing and Weight Watchers. I and mean, we're all pushing to try to get better access to information. Um, but it's, again, it's, it's always going to be a problem, I think, in general, right? We're never going to have a perfect data set that has absolutely everything measured perfectly. And you just kind of have to figure out how to work around it. Yeah. And I think, uh, again, feedback, um, and, and Eamon, I do want to feedback. Feedback we've gotten from, from the market is, and again, some of those clients are, are large consumers of, of other groups, uh, other data products within Nielsen, is there is a... Uh, a knowledge and acknowledgement that that there you know some sharing may happen down the road and there's openings to those to those borders maybe uh, you know Donald Trump hasn't hasn't gotten involved yet on those um, however uh, <laughs> however um, you know it, it is it is still a problem I, I've um, you know we got a lot of feedback from from clients we work with that say you know we want to measure this this and this or is Facebook and Google gonna own the world is it even worthwhile to even measure anything else and uh, so it's from an agency perspective, Eamon, how do you, how do you see that? I, I, I think it goes back to standardization to it and, and where attribution is evolving to. That's one place, and again, it goes back to partnership and then with the clients. If the largest clients, the largest, if the top 50 largest clients say, we want change, and they get together and say, we want change because attribution tells us this. And, and, and you know, we saw GM do this. Um, they can force change. Okay. If we want change, Money still talks, and the larger spenders have the ability and have the clout to make that happen. And attribution modeling with that clout can say, here's how it has to work. And also force not just the agencies, but also uh, Google, Google and, and uh, Facebook and others to actually also have more transparency. We're never going to get complete transparency, but more transparency. So I think that transparency it will not just be there for agencies, but it will now become a bigger issue for vendors as well as for the Googles and the uh, Facebooks of the world. Okay. So that, that perspective of, yeah, essentially the people who are paying for driving that change. Yeah, they will. Um, I, th I, I want to go well, hit one last topic. I know we're going to have, I want to leave a little time for, for Q&A. Um, uh, but, but one thing that I always try to do is and, and like to do with my teams and clients of ours is to understand an actual real world example. So we've talked about a lot of situational things and I think um, some very, very interesting points of view on, on the space, where it's going. But for each of your companies, and feel free to, you know, you know, toot your own horns on it, but also I'd love to understand, you know, at Verizon uh, and, and all of your companies, and, and certainly I mean, if you can share a, a particular client or, or at least case study, what is an actual, what is a, a, something you've done in the last year or two in terms of measurement and attribution that's just been a wild success. Like you had a, you had a, you started here, you ended here, and it was just overall positive in a variety of different ways. It doesn't have to be saved you ten billion dollars, but but or, or or yielded some crazy. Just what was a what was an example that each of you can have um, that you can walk the group through that that shows that this stuff works and that it's successful. Um, and maybe we'll start down, Teresa. Wild successes. I know there's a lot of wild successes <laughs> oh, in analytics, but um, come on. I, no, I mean, I, honestly, I don't. I don't think there's. I don't think analytics. Marginal is, success. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think analytics is a silver bullet. I mean, I think that we're constantly in partnership with our agency and and other kind of outside partners. We're constantly pushing the envelope to try to understand, kind of peel back that onion, and understand more and more what's going on and what's working and what's not. But I. I'm trying to think in my career if I ever said, what, oh my gosh, I'm so amazed at this finding. I can't say I have, but it's, it's an incrementality gain. It's, it's how do you get a little bit smarter and a little bit better each day, and, and we're constantly pushing to get there. But I, I can't really point to one. Is there an area, of your, an area of your company that uses, let's call it MTA or any other attribution more than others? Um, well, I mean, I sit within the CMO organization, so I yeah. think, like, like many of the people talking, that tends to be where we're focusing, right? And particularly given the size of Verizon's media spend, obviously that's an, 
fruitful area to analyze and to understand, you know, what's going on. And, you know, a, a one or even a 10% improvement results in a huge, it's a huge amount of money, if you think about it that way. So, um, again, well, it's not necessarily a silver bullet. Anything that we can do to eke efficiencies and get smarter about what we're doing, um, you know, the better. And so I can think of, you know, a million little things that we've learned that have added up to be a lot, but not necessarily yeah. one thing where I've said, oh, my gosh, that was the, you know, the holy grail of okay. learnings this year. Okay. All right. Michael, I'm sure you have a holy grail somewhere. Uh, none I can tell in public. The, uh, <laughs> but one thing I want to point out, you know, one of the things we keep finding is we try to guess uh, and understand the buying cycle of our consumers, especially if we're getting a new credit card. So it's kind of a lot of reasons somebody might want to get a new credit card or add another credit card, and that journey takes a lot of different pieces. And one of the types of sites that we were never quite sure what to do with were shopping sites. So if you go to a shopping site that accepts advertising or sponsorships, you might say, well, it's a perfect place to get a credit card. And other people would say, well, why would you get a credit card if you're already on the site shopping, you're ready to buy something, so you probably already have a credit card. And we didn't get lots of direct clicks from it, so of course the last click guys were saying this is silly. And what multi-site attribution starts to do is help you understand where different categories of sites or different types of media places actually play a really good role. They weren't showing up in view through quite the way we expected. They weren't showing up as early uh, introducers quite the way we expected. But once we put multi-site attribution, <coughs> you start to understand for which groups of people, for which types of products, it's actually the right place to spend. And so short of chopping it out of the plan altogether and having a whole group of sites be unhappy and the marketing suffering, instead you start to discover that your hypothesis over where something plays may not be correct and actually can be proven out to do a more optimal spend. So it would have been easy to just say, let's shrink our site portfolio and spend on fewer sites and we'll save the money to something else with it. This actually saved the marketing by recognizing that this type of site played a really good role for certain yeah. types of customers. Yeah. Small, but it was no, something that's very we wouldn't cool. have known beforehand. So. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, th I agree. I think for us, even taking that up a level is, as marketers, as data-driven marketers, we've always looked at, at, in a world where we had last touch, we were focusing on those lower funnel channels because they were showing the best you know, return on investment or the best return for us um, in driving, driving conversions. So, you know, it was that self-fulfilling prophecy of optimizing towards that low uh, impact media or low funnel media. So a real game changer for us was once you bring in that multi-touch, the art and science of it, the science always disproving that those upper funnel um, touch points were actually driving value. And then the art of as a strategy, us believing that, you know, catching that consumer or getting in front of that consumer when she's in a high consideration moment was always important. Now we have the data to back that up. So when we're building out our plans or, or adjusting our investment, we now have data that supports that investment in those more mid or upper funnel channels that wouldn't have shown off as, as a as a great investment in the last touch model. So the consideration and sort of mid funnel is, is something that it, it validated and, and shows that that is somewhere you need to spend time and spend money. Yeah. Okay, great. Amen. I'm sure you have a million examples and, but. Well, we were using um, different attribution vendors for uh, attribution. Uh, so I think from Converter Visual IQ, uh, a couple of other smaller ones as well. Uh, but the cost was pro prohibitive for many, many clients. So in the last t uh, year and a half, we developed our own attribution model uh, because we did have the data coming in, our log level data coming in. We were fit to pull in the TV data and we are fit to make the attribution to TV. So one of our clients was using a little bit of TV, direct mail, and branded search. That was it. Uh, and now they've gone completely full funnel because they see where the different channels are actually operating and they've gotten about 15% growth year on year. Mm. So uh, they went, and they were skeptical, uh, and even where they had, where they had their own digital um, channel they could work with, they weren't embracing um, um, how you could optimize in the digital area. So it'd be fit to use attribution, uh, the, the, the multi-attribution allowed them to catch both the offline as well as the offline together. And that was, be. and you moved that towards sort of an in-house solution for them yeah. to capture that? Yeah, okay. and it's a little more, it's a little more uh, cost uh, effective. But again, uh, the big thing with that is getting the right, the right device graph vendor. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the big, big key as well in standardization uh, because not all device graph vendors are born equal. Uh, so getting the right um, methodology that pulls the data across appropriately is very, very important. Yep, no, that, I, I agree. So I don't know how much time we have, uh, looks like a minute and a half. I don't know if we want to do any sort of questions. Um, if anyone has any questions for, for the panel here, we have, uh, we have the experts up here. I think we have a couple minutes left. Um, if not, we will finish right on time, but I don't know if there's any uh, right here, sorry. Email 
signups, plastic selects, uh, you know, things like that in your models? Yeah, uh, I go all the way down the, 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 whatever KPI the client's working with. So it's not just the site visit, it is all the way down. In fact, one of our clients is CDC of the Country of America, and we go all the way to chats and appointments made and appointments kept. Yeah, but there's also that mix of customer journey analysis. So you think of ClickFox and other tools that line up all the touch points for the customer service side. If you think about it, that's basically an attribution play as well. It's saying which of these touch points predicted NPS or some other type of customer behavior. I think you're going to find those things merging together in a much more a rational way so that you understand touch, marketing touch points of a current customer can have a lot of impact on NPS the same way different types of behaviors on the customer servicing side can actually play into are those things more impactful sometimes than your marketing for new customer acquisition. So we've experimented with bringing those things together, but we haven't seen a vendor yet bring all this stuff in in quite the right way. And I think you're going to see a couple of vendors pop up this year. Uh, probably IBM, I know, has been thinking about these kind of things as well. Uh, there are some uh, cool ideas floating around. Cool. Gentlemen in the way back there. Great question. <laughs> um, I think, the, I, again, it goes back to things, the, the questions you're trying to answer, right? So when you're looking at, to your point, whether it's distribution or pricing or channel mix, kind of everything all up and all in, I think econometrics is still sort of the, the gold standard for that. But you'll never get down to the level of granularity in an econometric model that you might want to optimize within the digital channel. So you're not going to get at you know, this format versus that format, even, even when you're doing quite a lot of activity as we are. So I think going back to there's no silver bullet, right? So econometrics answers a certain body of questions. Multi-touch within digital answers a certain bodies of questions. Brand effects and other things are going to answer different questions. So I, I don't think there's ever going to be this magic one way that we do everything. I think it's about looking at a variety of different outputs and then digesting that and then figuring out what to do with it. But the overlap part is tough when they, on the edges when they overlap and they tell you to do very different things, that's a tough case and that often comes down to your ability to understand which is predicting the right way for which types of aspects. And that's, uh, you said art and science earlier, I think that's one of the parts of it is working with our agencies and partners to say, econometrics suggests this, attribution says something slightly different on the interface, what's the right answer in between that works for all of us? Well, uh, I was told uh, we're, we're, we're wrapping up here. Um, I wanted to, first of all, thank the, the panel of, uh, for, for their great insight and great feedback. Um, I know uh, myself and, and my team is going to be out um, in the, uh, answering any questions in, in the um, main area, but also I'm not sure if you guys are around for any of the rest of the day. Thank you very much um, and appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you.